Dana Sandor, who will make his speech at the point. After which, we will officially introduce him our guests. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the press. It is good to be back here in the Charles Bayon Conference Hall here at the Ministry of Information, Cultural Affairs, and Tourism. We are humbled to uh, act uh, on behalf of the government in the absence of the, the minister who is on the president's official delegation to attend the forum on Africa China China Africa cooperation in the People's Republic of China. Uh, we also want to commend the Public Affairs Department for the work they continue to do to keep this platform very interactive ensuring that officials of government from various ministries and agencies can continue to come here and use this place in forwardance to the one government, one communication agenda. I'd like to recognize the IT Minister, Mr. Johnny S. Tucker, who has just joined us. He was accompanied by Mr. Chokonta, the director of the Liberia News Agency. Today we have as our guest no other but a distinguished Liberian scientist. Dr. Dubek Krizdan has come to speak to issues of national concern as far as the National Public Health Institute is concerned. He will make the proper introduction of members of the delegation he mounts the podium. But before I invite Dr. Dubek to the, the podium, I will seize the moment to make the following remarks on behalf of the government of Liberia. A lot of things have happened. A couple of issues have caught the attention of the, the ministry and thus the following remarks. The government of Liberia categorically refutes claims by Senator Thomas J. Newman that the establishment of the war in economic crimes court is a recipe for chaos and that such move will derail the peace and stability of the country. The government is aligned over the statement attributed to the Senator from Grand Peter County, who himself was at some point in time the head of one of the many warring factions we have in the country. It is reported that Senator Newman to a gallery of peace activists last week at a peace symposium organized in commemoration of the 21st anniversary of the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Accord. He said that the establishment of the war in economic ground courts is a recipe for chaos. According to him, the war in economic ground court will destabilize the country and uh, destabilize the peace and stability of the country. He wanted to say that the establishment of the court 
is the breach of the spirit and intent of a comprehensive peace of call. The senator went on to add that the setting up of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission meant that we waive our right to prosecute war crimes that were committed during 40 years of bloodbath that Liberia experienced. Now, as a government, we like to categorically disagree with Senator Nimnet and reject in the strongest term just the idea that he believes that the pursuit of the establishment of the war and economic crime court will derail and destabilize the country. There was no choice for Liberians. between the pursuit of criminal prosecution, the payment of reparation, or the establishment of the war plan court or the Children's Reconciliation Commission. These measures were all born out of the comprehensive peace accord, and they must be taken seriously. If they have been, if all these years, previous government have failed to implement the recommendation of the TRC report, it cannot be under excuse. It cannot be under excuse that because previous government failed to do it, and therefore this government cannot do it. We see these statements as being anti progressive and against the spirit and intent of the goodwill of the president that have been exercised. Liberians want justice. They want peace and reconciliation. Executive Order Number 131, establishing the Office of the War and Economic Crimes Code, is a measure by the President for the people of Liberia to be given what they want. If the people who are the custodians of the peace, want justice and reconciliation, then we do not see the statement as attributed to the Senator as being truthful. We categorically disagree and resent that characterization and the action taken by the President to establish the Office of the War and Head of the Strand Court is a step that will derail the peace of the country. The president is concerned about media reports about very high salaries and benefits of officials of some state-owned enterprises and autonomous commissions. I know there are media reports and there are concerns from the public that People in some agencies, state-owned enterprises, are receiving astronomical figures in salaries and benefits. The president is concerned about that. And so here's the position of the government. His Excellency President Joseph Lima Guaca is concerned about media reports that indicates that some officials of state-owned enterprises and autonomous commissions are receiving very high salaries and benefits. The president has therefore instructed the Bureau of State-Owned Enterprise to review these reports and recommend to him appropriate measures to ensure that there is parity and fairness in compensation structures across all government institutions, particularly the state-owned enterprises. The president is committed to ensuring that no official of the government disproportionately takes home more than others for a similar kind of level of work they do for the country. 
on this point, I'd like to add that with specific reference to the Liberia Telecommunication Authority, it's been reported by some of our friends in opposition who follow the news that people try to make a mountain out of a muhu. We all know the Urubalu legal entanglement that led to the constitution of acting board of commissions at the LTA by the president. The LTA has an acting board with no tenure and with very limited authority to take certain actions. As a government, we are not unmindful of the privilege of the campaign that we ran here seven months ago. We came to rescue a country that was plunged into chaos and backwardness by a reckless regime. We came to rescue a country whose meager resources were being looted on an industrial scale. These are the situations that we came to rescue. The steps taken by the president so far to institute structural institutional reform across government is evident of the government's commitment to living up to that promise. So we are not insensitive. The government of Liberia, the government of Liberia, headed by His Excellency President Joseph Imabwata, has instituted no salary, new salary structure across all government agencies. Meaning to say that. Nobody has increased their pay. No new salary has been added to anybody. We are still carrying on the structural reform across all government agencies. And that begins with the CSA. If, for example, the government intends to undo the Google's harmonization policy that, that, that witnessed the massive decline in salary of civil servants, how do we do it? Of course, you need to have a civil service that is well structured, that reflects value for money. And so the civil service director general has scrupulously been back on that detail and he's doing it well. So the structural reform is going across government. Some of the benefits that have sparked public outcry and people try to attribute it to the inability of the government to, to, to rescue the country. And I see all sort of derogatory remarks being made, or oh, they are insensitive, they didn't come to rescue, where those Astronomical figures placed in benefit by the Quaker administration? Of course not. Do we intend to keep it that way? No. We do not intend to keep it that way. But what is important to be stated here is that when the XYCC government instituted the harmonization policy, what some of those people are state owned enterprises, particularly the LTA, did. So you were making $7,000. At the end of the month, the less salary, they introduced harmonization. Harmonization reduced your salary from 7900 to 4500 So what they cleverly did was to derive a strategy to increase their benefits. They increased their benefits. They added housing, they added generator, they added transportation, they added gasoline and everything. So they did, they did have a motive to get more money, even in the face of a book of harmonization policy that was being instituted by the government. The past commissioners at the LTE, almost all the benefits that we're talking about here as a country have been approved by the past commissioners who are currently on suspension. Some of them have resigned. The people who are current at the LTS who are not receive generator, they are not receive transportation vehicle for the for the, for the entity. So we are not insensitive. But you have to understand that for this structural reform to take shape and form, it is not an overnight thing. If you want to be, you can be arbitrary about it as a government, 
Of course, you have a deliberate intention. All of which is how the asset recovery team has been stuck to the court. Six years ago, there was a government in place running this country. There were procurement processes that went on to procure vehicles, office equipment. We took over this place. You media people, you bear testament to that. This place was like a big hole, very filthy. Do we just grab the ministry and move for it? Are there not going to be some investigation to ensure people who manage government assets for the last six years can come for it? Of course, the president issued an executive order, constituted the asset recovery tax force. What has happened? That asset recovery tax force has been stuck in the court. So, as a country, we complain. Oh, we've been victimized by corruption. Public officials are corrupt. When there's an attempt by one government to ensure that past officials can account for their action, you tell me as which point? What better do we want for our country? This government is not going to be distracted. We came here on a matter of change, and there's no attempt that we are going to wave up or walk back on our promises. So, for the situation at the LTA, the president has instructed that the Bureau of State Home Enterprises carries out an investigation, not just for the LTA, but across all state home enterprises, to ensure that there can be an equilibrium in benefits and salaries. So the Biden administration has instituted no policy that gave any fat benefit to anybody as it has been insinuated, wrongfully insinuated for that matter, by forces from the opposition and by some members of the, the public. So we know the scrutiny to which this government is going to be held will be different because we campaign on a very ambitious platform. We are not going to walk back on those things. The government is committed, and we will make the change. Lastly, I can understand that there is an attempt to make this government to resemble the road regime of the past. I took 22 million from our foreign reserve, went in the street and said they gave it to money and change us for motor exercise. That war regime, who's from our minister? Today is a figurative. That war regime, who's from our officials? I have scorned justice because they did not come for the stewardship. We are making frantic effort. To make his excellency government resemble the Kuna government. Oh, he did it so they're doing the same thing too. That parity of reasoning is wrong. It's flawed. It's appalling. Because we do not share the same attributes. By this time in 2018, the president had built 46 coming buildings for himself. By this time in 2018, Antonio Maguire has bought a duplex, a mansion, on Ragos Street Highway. But this time in 2018, Samurai Molokoli has begun the process of building the duplexes across Morocco. But this time in 2018, officials of government were swimming in state resources. Today, what do you see across the government sector? What do you see? Dignity is being restored. Leadership by example. So there is no similar attribute between the road regime that plunged this country into chaos and backwardness and this regime 
and is held by his excellency President Joshua. So that attempt to say, oh, we stole, but the other stealing too. That attempt, we were exposed to deception, not just by our words, but by our actions. As you may all be aware, President Boaka is he part of the country. Now he using one stone to kill two birds. He's going to Indonesia, Bali, and then on war he will move to uh, Beijing, China, to attend the forum on China Africa cooperation. So let me just give you a few updates from the, the engagement the president has so far uh, in Indonesia. Uh, President Boaka and his team of senior government officials are in Asia. As of today, they are concluding the Indonesia Africa Forum, where African and Indonesian leaders have been holding very fruitful conversations as to how they can cooperate on issues of mutual interest and concern. At a gathering, our President, His Excellency, Joseph Mabwaka made a case for serious investment from Indonesia and Asia in key sectors of the Liberian economy that are important for the realization of government's arrest agenda. Of course, we all know now that the arrest agenda of the government stands for agriculture, rural infrastructure, rural law, education, sanitation, health, and tourism. These are key sectors through which the government is working to transform the lives of the Liberian people. In order for the government to do this, the government is rallying extensive international partnership and support from investors with the capital to make the needed investment to create the jobs that will transform the Liberian economy. Indonesia is one of such partner countries it has a long history of partnership and cooperation with Liberia, and our people share common characteristics, including our love for our stable food rice. Indonesia has come of age and is a major rice producer. We are seeking to draw on their expertise in, an area, in, in the area, including palm oil production, Rural energy and public health research and educational change. President Waka echoed the message loudly and went a step forward to propose the establishment of a full Indonesian embassy in Liberia to further enhance cooperation and the change on these issues. The president also held a bilateral with Indonesian President Joko Wudu. President Wudu affirmed Indonesia's interest to work with Liberia to strengthen and invest in sectors in which the two nations share similarities and advantages. President Wudu then invited Liberia to join the Council of Palm Oil Producing Countries, CPOC, and to be a part of the South South Tropical Forest Corporation to leverage Liberia's huge forest reserve. The Indonesian leader also invited Liberia's participation in the 68th anniversary of the Asian African Conference, AEC, that is expected to take place in 2025. A couple of weeks ago, it was reported that there was a mass protest at the Salah Rock Corporation. And as a result of the protest, owners of the company threatened to pull out of that area. The Minister of Information announced that several jobs will be lost as a result of the action of the company. The Minister also admonished Liberians to desist for violent protestation. It has a way of driving away investors who are in the country and those who intend to come to invest. So, in the wake of that news, the government announces that uh, Jetty 
Uh, Jetty Robo has acquired Sara Robo Corporation in Wiara Magi County, saving about 900 jobs and families from economic hardship and a significant boost to the global economy. The government is glad to report that Sara Robo Corporation has been acquired by Jetty Robo, a local robot producing company in the same area in Magi. Sarah Robert decided to close down this operation in late June following violent protests on the plantation that led to the damage of properties. The government of Liberia intervened and those who were alleged to have been the instigators of the violence are currently facing trial. The government is determined to use the case to deter threats to investment which is solely needed to aid the government's agenda. Sarah Robert was, however, determined to close down until recently through a competitive bidding process. As we are informed, Jetty Robert purchased the company and has taken over its operation. The action, the action saves about 900 jobs that will not be lost. The government is pleased at this report and will remain committed to working with the team at the Robot Corporation to ensure that their investment is secure and that there will be no further threats to their operations. To the workers, we urge you to cooperate with the new team and resolve any issue you have through peaceful and non-violent means. Lastly, uh, yesterday news broke about the solemn passing of statesman and former chief chairman of National Investment Commission, Dr. Richard Tobot. The government is saddened by this report. Dr. Tobot was pivotal during the administration of former President Salif in attracting the investment that was needed to advance economic growth. He was instrumental in promoting Liberia as an attractive destination for foreign direct investment. Toba was an avid language educated, a Harvard graduate in economics, and a doctor of jurisprudence, JD, from Columbia University. He will be missed solely. The government extends solace to the Uri family. On that note, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me now stand on the existing protocol to invite to the podium the Enfield boss, a no other person but Dr. Duba Chris Mark to make his presentation. Greetings from the rest of the Enfield family 
who are working diligently to ensure that the public health status of this country is in good shape. This is my second time facing you, and uh, it's quite an interesting time we find ourselves in, not because of any form, but because of the global outbreak of the monkeypox virus, which causes the disease Mpox. Um, yesterday, at the facilities of the National Public Health Institute, we did announce the incident management system, which is that overall umbrella entity that supervises and controls the national response when it comes to outbreak, particularly an outbreak of this nature, which has been declared by the WHO and the Africa CDC as a health situation of international concern. Monkeypox, as we speak to our people all across this nation, is a virus that is transmitted through person-to-person -person contact that is transmitted through being in contact with animals that are infected with the monkeypox virus. And it is also, as we have continued to say, transmitted sexually, but we have not come to describe it as a sexually transmitted disease. We always want to make that clear from the scientific and medical community so that there is not a confusion with actually defined sexually transmitted diseases. When one is infected with monkeypox virus, it takes between two about 2 to 14 to 22 days to come down with the actual disease manifestations. It starts with fever, muscle aches, headache, lymph nose swelling, and of course, as the disease progresses in the infected individual or individuals, you begin to see outward signs of the infection, which are characterized by what in medicine we call vesicular papules, or simply rashes or bumps, if I can put it simply in our Nigerian palace. And those bumps are filled with some fluid, some liquid that we call pulse, simply. Those bumps are larger if you want to compare that with other pox diseases, it's lighter than what you have with the smallpox and chickenpox. And those rashes, you can find them all over the body, and they are expressed on the extremities, meaning on the hands and the feet. So even if you wore your clothes, it's difficult to hide it. That would have been expressed in the hands, but specifically, what we call plantar expression is what we see, meaning that they are in your palm. You see the bumps all in the palms. The ones in the palm is where the virus is highly concentrated. That is why when an infected person sits in a location or sleeps on a, at, a, at a particular location on a bed, and you who are not infected sleeps on the same bed, uh, you are much more vulnerable and liable to be infected because that place becomes contaminated. That is where we talked about you not being in contact with those kind of surfaces. Um, 
the virus itself is treatable. Uh, there are medications of different types we call antivirus. Anti means against the virus. And also, besides being treatable, the disease itself uses epox is self-limited in science and medicine, meaning some people can get sick with the virus. They will not take any tablet. They will not take any injection, none of those antivirus, and they still become pure. But we don't want you to rely on this to stay home in case you find yourselves with these symptoms that we listed earlier. Our different immune or defense systems in our bodies are not the same from individual to individual. So one person may have a higher ability to fight back the virus, another person may have a less or limited ability to fight back the virus. The best you can do when that happens, when you see those symptoms, uh, is to report yourself or report any family member to the nearest health clinic or you can call 4455, which is the hotline that is currently being activated since we have the situation on hand. In terms of prevention, avoid contact with infected persons or persons who you suspect to be infected. Uh, you should have very responsible sexual behavior for you men, and you will say it very clearly, wear your condoms. Uh, that's one of the best, so far, preventive measures. Or at best, abstain. Um, also, there are vaccines available. You're laughing, but it's serious. <laughs> um, there are vaccines available, but these vaccines are not in high numbers. This particular disease, MPOX, is so far now all around the world. It is found in the United States, it is found in countries of Europe, it is found on other continents. So that tells you that everybody is fighting to get the vaccine. And given our own economic status, we, to a larger extent, depend on an entity called Gavi, which collects a lot of these vaccines from the manufacturers through the assistance of the very rich countries and some goodwill people, and then divide these vaccines with countries that are unable to get the vaccines. And so, through the WHO, these arrangements have been made to bring some vaccines into the country. Vaccine is one of the most uh, preventable elements or me mental or means. Now, Yesterday, we reported to you the status of the MPOX infection in Liberia. As an entity judiciarily responsible for public health in this country, it is incumbent upon us to be very open, very transparent, and very bold with you as to the status of what is obtaining. And to the best of our ability, I can vouch that we have been doing that. Currently, or before then, in the past, when I last uh, faced you here, we reported that we have the previous five cases 
and an additional case which made it six. Now, all those cases, those six cases, were not active. Meaning, those six cases were suspected, they were confirmed, out of many other cases that we got, but those particular six cases were the ones reported to be positive, but they were not active. All of those who had that uh, came down with the disease, all of them got healed. So we have zero <coughs> mortality rate. That was before the announcement or the declaration by the World Health Organization and the Africa CDC of an outbreak of uh, the monkeypox virus, uh, mpox, the disease, the disease it causes, and declaring it as a health situation of international concern. After that point, we had no more kids. Then, suddenly, we began to activate our response system. What we did was to activate our response system, including the, the epidemiological surveillance group and the county health officers, to be in readiness. Why did we do this? We have, in Central Africa, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we have most of the cases in the world. There are about almost 30 to 35,000 cases registered there, with almost 2,000 deaths presently. These cases have been transmitted through cross-border transmission to the uh, other countries in the surrounding region, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, etc. When you come down to West Africa, in where we are located, Nigeria has the highest cases. Then, when you come to our bordering countries, we have Africa Coast with almost 33 cases just between July and the end of August. And we find ourselves just right next to the Africa Coast. If you look at how Ebola entered this country, it came through cross-border transmission. Just in the last 24 hours, or within the last uh, eight hours, let's put it that way, the National Public Health Institute received an alert from the public health entity in the Republic of Guinea. We were on the phone with the doctors and public health practitioners there today, having got the alert earlier last night, that there is a seven-year-old who was confirmed positive. This seven-year-old is traveling with the mother and they are attempting to cross into Liberia. I will hold it right there and come back to that. On the Liberian side, immediately when this was declared as a public health situation of international concern, in the last four days, in Sino County, or in the last week, there were reports of quote unquote an outbreak. Um, which the National Public Health Institute refuted. And that was based on the science, the trend of the epidemiological surveys we did, and the clinical outcomes. Um, there were suspected cases in Sino County. It was reported that these five cases were 
according to the media report, uh, an outbreak and positive. That was not the case. What actually happened is that our county health teams and public health teams suspected several persons to be infected with the monkeypox virus. Um, in total, there were eight persons suspected. That's in Saigo County, in a region called uh, in the uh, region called Jedepo, uh, specifically in Dedwoken. This is a very difficult terrain to navigate because of the river, the distance going in there, and the environmental factors. They were able to go. We found an ambulance, took a car, the car stopped them to a river or to a particular portion of the road. They took uh, motorbikes to continue because only motorbikes could navigate the rest of the way. They got to one of the largest rivers in that area and then crossed over using a canoe. And these are very dedicated uh, hard-working public health practitioners uh, who are devoting their time to ensuring that we detect these cases just as you have detectives for criminals we have disease detectives also and that's what they do uh, generally that's what we do and they are on the front line and what they came up with was there were eight persons suspected to have the monkeypox virus. Now, we like to be very careful with the terminologies that we use, and we said that yesterday, most of you who were not there. We have cases, and these cases are defined as either probable case, uh, suspected case, and a confirmed case. So when you understand these terminologies, which we have the responsibility to do uh, as a pedagogic process to make you to understand, then you will appreciate uh, the work we are doing, and you will appreciate your own reporting, that you'll be, to a larger extent, reporting almost accurately. And so, when just visually we see something that appears to be the definition of the disease and with the symptoms of fever, that is a case in this period or this era of MPOX. Now, when we know that this person has several other symptoms, right? Fever, headache, and, and all the other things we talk about, it may not reach to the point of rashes. We say that person is a suspected case. So now you have suspicion on a person, right? Just as it is. Now we take samples, like the scrapings and the fluids from the pores, uh, those, those rashes. We take blood and send them out to the laboratory, what do we want to do? It intends to give us an answer that will confirm what we are suspecting. So when the laboratory result comes back positive, there and then we say this is a confirmed case. And so when we apply that to these eight cases that we saw, which we suspected, it turned out that one of the cases, who was a seven-year-old female, had all the characteristics, both internal and external, of MPOX. And samples were taken 
and sent to the lab in Monrovia. We had two samples immediately sent while the rest of the samples were coming up. Out of those two samples, we found that one was positive. And so, with the previous cases that we had, which were six, right, which were resolved, no death, and now we add these two that we tested, that makes it a total of what? Eight cases in general. Out of those eight, one was confirmed. So those new cases that we have, those eight new cases, one was confirmed. So we have one confirmed case and seven suspected cases presently. Now, when that happens, we also follow and do contact tracing, meaning this person must have come in contact with other people, and that's how the virus spreads. They keep in contact with the mother, the aunt, the father, and many other relatives. So we are following all those contacts to see their status. What we have gathered is that the mother has also begun to show symptoms of uh, the monkeypox viral infection. And we most likely, given our experience, uh, we most likely come down with MPOX. So that is it for the sinus situation. The rest of the samples are on their way coming, and when those samples are tested, the results from them will be made available to you again at a subsequent press briefing, a regular one that we will be doing uh, during the course of this uh, disease that has uh, uh, captivated, is captivating the whole world now. We are taking experience from Ebola and COVID in order to be as proactive as we can. And that is what the National Public Health Institute has been doing since then. Um, we have been visiting all our border points. We went to the uh, entry points such as Freeport of Monrovia and the uh, RRA. We should be going to go other side. We decided to also visit other points of entry, like those with Guinea and Africa Coast in Ganta, for example, and in uh, Logatour. With the possibilities that provided us, we will visit the total border that is bordered in the Ivory Coast and uh, any border point in River G as well as um, Maryland. Now, you will note that we want to also indicate that this patient who is now positive never had any travel history, never traveled outside of uh, Sino to either go Grand Cru or uh, River G or uh, those bordering counties. So the question in your mind will be, how could that have happened? Well, there are people who come in and out of uh, the Vero counties. And that's one possibility. They have been translated in terms of that. So um, we are continuing to strengthen our border points uh, in terms of our surveillance, and we are strengthening our response, which you are actively seeing with the cases that we have had and the present active case. Um, to, tomorrow we intend going to other border points in order to continue where we start. We have asked the WHO for diagnostic kits and we do hope to begin to work things out with our own in-house capability to uh, produce our laboratory uh, defined test for monkeypox so that we don't wait 
for kids to come to us before we begin the mouth detection. So as it stands, uh, we are in a situation declared by the WHO and the Africa CDC as an outbreak uh, continentally. And we take it as such. Uh, we have the professional responsibility uh, both to our country, our government, and to our colleagues in the region to uh, make these explanations clear to you. I will stop this part and we entertain any question probably I may then address what I may not have said. Thank you. Please take four questions at a time. You will go down four questions at a time. Yeah, I'm just sorry, I'm the host of Lantern TV. Uh, you talk and one of them, because I'm about to open, but then I'm going to work with a mission of our students to see how there's a business. Can I uh, work first? And uh, you know, you travel to Congo, so do you care to tell us about your trip? Yeah, I'm John Sharif. I work for uh, Our Jams Monrovia Online Radio, Atlanta, Georgia, and I also do some writings for the Inquirer. You spoke very extensively. My question to you is how effective is your PR? with respect to letting the country go much better than just using it as a conduit to get your message out. Another thing is, you talked about one of the, 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 the most populous countries in West Africa, Nigeria. You wouldn't mention it in passing, you didn't say how many persons were affected in all of that. A population of over 200 million people. Can you just explain that? Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Kodeo Last time we came there, I asked a question. I saw the big answer, so let me try again. How much do you need to fight this disease? How much do you need to be down the sense? You hear it? Um, someone said, Welcome, Michael. I'm now Lisa, you're getting from Star TV Library. In your statement, you did mention of contact tracing, and you also said, um, this issue is communicable. Do you mind telling us if any of your contact tracing really mentioned it all? Are these people currently? If yes, tell them they are not doing If you talk about disease from the human disease, if the people are currently not, Okay. Yes. Okay. Then you respond to And I will answer your questions in a summary form to address all of what have been posed. Uh, we are doing everything possible to get down to the community level. So when you talk about the schools, that includes the community level in order to work with them to, in order to work with them uh, to uh, effect this response. Um, in terms of dollar amount, we are working out, uh, we have already worked out the national uh, response plan and those figures will be uh, augmented, updated, given the new situations that we have in order to uh, submit same to the government and other agencies. Uh, it will be too premature to announce here uh, how much we need, or how much we don't need when this is a dynamic and revolving exercise. We certainly need every penny that we need. Uh, I will just leave it at that. Uh, certainly, the kids 
have been quarantined, uh, isolated, let's put it that way, and uh, care is being taken. The only difficult thing is getting to this uh, terrain uh, to bring them you know, closer to much uh, better facility, but every other thing that is needed in terms of the care is being transported there the best way possible. We need an ambulance in that area almost like immediately. So uh, in terms of what we may need as logistics, that's something any one of us can advocate for. Uh, so that's where we are with that. All right, and that remains the day I will put for Honor uh, FM. The last time we appeared, I saw only uh, officials from Enfield. Today you are here again, only Enfield officials. And in your emphasis, you talked about the WHO, and in the you talked about the health ministry and all of practitioners that need to join you. So I'm concerned about a cordial relationship between the health ministry within Nigeria and that of Kenfield. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Alison Smoke. Thanks, Dad, for your presentation. But the concern of the Liberian have been. I work for quality newspaper. The concern of the Liberian people have been drawn to a wet issue. You know, there's a saying that says, Sooner is the best. So how are your team and you working when it comes to making awareness across the country? Or are you waiting for the virus to spread in huge quantity before you embark on awareness? Thank you very much. So uh, thank you. My name is Manuel Kulu and I report for SkyFM. The other thing um, about the import issue is concern, especially when it comes to saving life. But you have not been definitive about how much you need. And many are concerned. Many, many, many are concerned. Why do you want to get the actual amount um, before um, <laughs> things get escalated, before you start to measure? Why are you doing Thank you. My name is Christopher Benjamin, number nine. Uh, I want to know how can the community and local organizations support government efforts in combating this pain of disease? Thank you. Okay. Um, in terms of awareness, um, certainly we can get to our people through the news media, that is radio, not just the print, press, and social media. We have been using that aspect. We have printed some uh, flyers that have been sent all around the counties and sent to our border entry points. The next thing we intend doing as this situation is dynamic and evolving is to reduce some of our awareness clips into the local vernaculars. That has uh, begun in sense of uh, developing those those uh, uh, clips. Um, again, we don't. We have a situation whereby uh, the virus outbreak of healthcare in the entire country requires a holistic approach. We work very collaboratively with the Ministry of Health in order to address uh, the current outbreak and any other situation that we have. It's not the only thing we have on hand, there are other public health issues that we have on hand. Uh, at the announcement of the incident management system uh, yesterday, uh, the Ministry of Health was there uh, in our meetings that we have uh, every Friday that brings together all of our collaborating partners like the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the African Centers for Disease Control, USAID, AFINET, uh, GIZ, uh, 
etc., etc. The Ministry of Health is always also present. Uh, you know, is is present or has a place in that meeting. So um, it is is our duty to serve the healthcare of this country. Uh, the NFIL has the responsibility to look at public health, and those things are defined, and we're working according to what uh, our uh, statutory uh, obligations are in terms of what we do. Um, basically, basically, our effort also, in terms of uh, budgetary allocation from the government, we have always asked for the government to increase the budget for health, which is the Ministry of Health, and for the National Public Health Institute. These documents are public documents. Uh, they are available, you can look at them, and you will know where each entity stands in terms of government's budgetary allocation. We, 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 we talk about this because we don't know when there will be an outbreak like what we have now. So we don't have to always wait for an outbreak before rushing out to government to say, this is how much we need to carry out an outbreak. And that is why when these questions come, we think that's just not the appropriate way to address it. If I announce here today we need $100 million, what does it do? If I say we need $10, it has absolutely no, no, no effect. Just a pronouncement will have no effect in that response. So our duty is to continue to uh, advocate as healthcare advocates uh, with our government and with our partners. As a result of this advocacy, we intended to meet with the Liberian legislature, but guess what? This advocacy paid off to the extent that the Health Committee, uh, or House Committee on Health, invited us uh, last week. They sent a very nice friendly letter that they wanted to see us to discuss the, the MPOX. And when we got there, we just talked about MPOS briefly. The next thing is they started asking us with all these challenges because we put for our challenges, uh, not just for MPOS, but as an institution. And um, Madam Honorable Julie uh, Fatuma Weir and Sam Weir and, and the other representative from uh, Grand Bassa who were present in the meeting with other representatives asked us about the, the budget. And they show us budget lines that were empty for Enfield. And so it showed them that what we were putting forth today as challenges were because of these, these empty budget lines. So they said, look, we are going to uh, inform plenary as to the importance of, of, of the Public Health Institute. Uh, and, and so they have started to work on those things. And I think that's where we want to concentrate. Uh, we don't want to give our figures here that will throw people off. We are working with what we have uh, uh, as a dynamic situation in the most according and efficient way. Uh, the question about uh, the cases in Nigeria, I, we did say here the last time, and I can repeat that, that in Nigeria presently there are 48 cases. At a time, there were just 33 when we reported uh, last week, when we reported here. And we did the same thing almost uh, yesterday when we had a press conference announcing the formation of the incident management system. So to date, we have uh, about 48 active cases in Nigeria. And we did stress uh, the seriousness because we have a lot of back and forth movement, trade and, and family relations uh, with, with Nigeria. Uh, people go in and out with the articles we have of order and with the DRC, which is indirect because we have a lot of students in, in uh, Rwanda who come back and forth for vacation. So we, so we made, uh, we made this, this uh, uh, representation. 
regarding the trip to the DRC. It was a gathering of uh, public health and scientific experts in Africa to discuss the impact outbreak and what we basically concentrated on was how do we address it as rapidly as possible and how do we link the outbreak to research on the continent which is in-depth biomolecular uh, research. This is one thing that we lack on the African continent because uh, in the West, like America, Europe, uh, they don't just say we saw three cases, four cases, they are gone, but they go beyond that to test, okay, what happened to these cases afterward? What happened to the virus? Is it changing? What happened to the survivors? Don't they go into these in-depth uh, studies? That's exactly what those partners are already doing here, like Preview, for example, is doing those kind of studies here. So that, you know, uh, we are saying that Africans, African scientists uh, should, you know, be in that position, and we are, to do these studies on behalf of the continent, so that we don't burden the, the other scientists who already, their countries are giving us resources, then we burden them of studying our situation again. Uh, I, I think, we think that it's not fair, so we brought it upon ourselves with goodwill from the Africa CDC, the Gates Foundation, and, and all foundations around to help us uh, establish, because it requires resources again. Uh, research is not cheap. Uh, so uh, that's, that was the crux of that meeting. During that meeting, Liberia reported on its, its uh, preparedness and, and uh, response exercises. That, and from what we reported, it was clear that we were far ahead of the curve. And our example countries to use, because we have already activated our uh, response systems in the counties at the district level. We, visit, we are visiting the ports. We are distributing uh, the, the flyers. You go at RIA now, uh, you see when incoming passengers are there, you see all of those posters there. They are separated according to where, which country you come from. So all of that is currently in action. And so with this outbreak, we are doing the best we can to address it. It is very good. I myself come from the volunteer background. Many of us here come from the volunteer background, and we know what that means. Currently, in fact, at the end field, uh, most, if not all, of some of our county uh, epi surveillance groups, uh, those are all volunteers, right at the uh, uh, pre port of Morovia, at RRA. And they go to work every day from 8 to whatever time they have to come home. They're not getting any pay for that. Like I did myself, coming into the country every year to provide services without pay. And, and, and these are efforts that require. Uh,